Lord, as we gather today for this time of study, we pray for a couple of things. One, that, uh, that obviously that you would be a part of this, that in whether we're here in this room or, or participating online, what we pray, Lord, is that uh, in these moments that we have engaging the text, that we it'd be used in a way that creates the, and f- continually forms the nature of Christ inside of us. Um, and which means then there sometimes things have to change, um, sometimes things have to be uh, increased. Uh, whatever it may be, O oh Lord, we want to be open to that. Uh, at the same time, we're mindful of your grace and mercy for what that means for us, uh, forgiveness, salvation, wholeness, uh, and th- this transformation that exists via your Holy Spirit uh, so that how we think, how we act, even who we are, uh, becomes fully associated with you. Uh, and then in this time of study, if we could sort of keep at bay just all the things that we normally carry, uh, burdens, thoughts, cares, concerns, worries, uh, keep them at bay for just an hour and a half. And uh, we know that they'll be waiting for us when we leave. But in this time, just to be fully present here, for uh, with you and with the text. And so we pray that in your name. Amen. All right, so Acts chapter 2 is what we looked at, uh, the majority of what we looked at last week. And so what I want to refresh us a little bit because we're going to finish up the last little part of chapter 2. Um, so the beginning of Acts chapter 2 is where you have Pentecost. It's the Jewish version of Pentecost. There's two Pentecosts or two givings uh, uh, of the Holy Spirit. One shows up uh, to Jews in in Acts chapter 2, and then in Acts chapter 10, you find the same thing with Gentiles. In this particular one, it begins with, they're in the the disciples and the the, the larger crowd of followers of Jesus. They're in the upper room. The Holy Spirit comes. There's two uh, symbols that we see. There's something that's like a wind, and there's something like fire that's present. Both of those in the Old Testament are symbols for the presence of God. Immediately then, the disciples are pushed out of the upper room under the direction of the Holy Spirit for witness. And so you have to think back a couple of weeks. What we'll find in Acts, and this is really, really important for us, is the giving of the Holy Spirit does a couple of things. One, it takes the work of Christ and solidifies that inside the life of a person. So on one level, it's very individualistic. And that's what Romans talks about, particularly Romans chapter 6, where you participate in the death of Christ, you participate in the resurrection of Christ. In Romans 6, Paul uses a word that's like grafting, and the idea is that you're grafted, you and Jesus and you are grafted together. Uh, um, I think we looked at Romans a couple of years ago. Uh, you can, if, you want, if you want to go back and refresh your memory, it's on our, on our website. Uh, so some of the work of the Holy Spirit is, uh, is tied to the individual, uh, so what the work of the Holy Spirit does inside of the person. At the same time, another work of the Holy Spirit is to push the person out into some form of witness. And this is not a debatable item. In the book of Acts, it, it is just part of the process. Now, sometimes the, the witness uh, is mainly in your style of life, your actions. Uh, there, there was a saint in the early church that used to say that uh, people join our ranks from the beauty of our life. So they see something in your life that is attractive, that is different, and we'll see this in Acts. You'll, there will be people outside the kingdom who see how they live inside of the kingdom, and, and they want some of that. Cornelius is an example. Remember Cornelius? Is, he's a God-fearer. This is in Acts chapter 10. He's a God-fearer, which means he's adopted the Jewish disciplines, even though he is not converted to Judaism. And he, uh, so he's attracted to a certain style of life. From that, under the direction of God, he sends people to Peter, and Peter finally is convinced to go. He leaves, and he goes to Cornelius. Cornelius tells his, his story, and then, of course, Peter prays, and then the Holy Spirit comes. But what, what, but what we see is that there's people outside the kingdom who are attracted to what's going on inside of the kingdom, and so the, 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 the visual witness sometimes is, is what draws people in. 
Uh, sometimes it's a verbal witness. In Acts, both of those are required, and they are expected. All right, so I want to pause for a little bit because that's, again, that's not something that, you know, uh, if I had to guess, most people inside the church think that the verbal witness probably comes from me, right? Yes, you know, so, but guess what? You were involved in that as well. So, but, but Acts, and there's like 14, 15 examples, specific examples in the book of Acts where Holy Spirit's given, person is converted into the kingdom, and immediately it comes with forms of witness and testimony. Uh, so we see this early on. Disciples receive this. They uh, receive the Holy Spirit, works inside of them. They're sent out into, into the surrounding area, and Peter gives this sermon, which is what we have in Acts chapter 2. Now, this sermon you could spend two months on. Uh, but the, and we'll, this we talked a little bit about last week. I'm going to summarize. What Peter, and this is a heavy Jewish thought, so he, he didn't come up with this. This is steeped in, in Old Testament. There was, there's a time that God is going to usher in the last days. And, the last, and this shows up in the prophets. And so it's, a, it's an age or it's a period of time that we don't know the extent of how long the term is. Remember we talked about chronos time, like time on your watch. We talked about kairos time, just the, 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 at the appointed time for a certain level of time. We, we don't know exactly minutes, hours, days, but it's an age or, or a season and it's ushered in, and it's all, it's in the Old Testament, it's called the last days. It's ushered in by something, and then the culmination of it is always described as the day of the Lord. Daniel's book of Daniel is a good, second half of the book of Daniel is a good example of this. First half of the book of Daniel is about Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego moving from Israel over into Babylon. The second half has to do with these visions that Daniel ha had. That, uh, that deal with the coming of the day of the Lord. Peter says, in Jesus Christ, this age of last days is now here. The significance of who Jesus is, what Jesus did, and what Jesus will continue to do under the work of the Holy Spirit uh, is we are now in what we call the last days. Now, early on, in the New Testament, the apostles and disciples thought that the last days was going to be a short term. By the end of the New Testament, they stopped trying to predict the, the time. So when the, uh, Jesus ascends, they're looking up into heaven as if to say, okay, go up, square it all off, and then come on back down. And, you know, and then the two angels come, you got to get busy, you know, start doing your work. And, and so they, they go in the upper room with the Holy Spirit. One of the, uh, the, the sign of uh, the, the last days is, through the, is the work of the Spirit. So this is all in Peter's sermon. I'm just recapping what, uh, what, what Peter preached. He's preaching to people who have relocated to Jerusalem for a Jewish worship festival. They're not, they're not, uh, they're not, you know, they don't live in Jerusalem. They're not natives of, of Jerusalem. They live in the surrounding area, like, like surrounding Israel. And, uh, and there were seven different festivals throughout the year that were temple types of worship. And they didn't, the day-to-day -day or the week-to-week -week events that took place in the temple was tied more so to sacrifice and prayers. The giant worship services, there were seven of them uh, in, in a year, and they would go on for about a week. And they would start, and then the end, normally the last day is the biggest day of the festival. Uh, but during, you know, your day-to-day -day worship is not like the worship that we have, where there's singing and, and all that and prayers and then preaching and things like that. That's, that's a late development. In the Old Testament and, and at this point in the New Testament, Worship in the temple or in a synagogue, either weekly or daily, was just either tied to sacrifice or tied to praying, that daily prayers at different times of the hour. And uh, um, so these, 
people are traveling up to Jerusalem for this religious festival, Peter is preaching to them. He's not preaching just to everybody. He's just pre preaching to the home crowd. These are all Jews that have just come into the city for, for worship. And, and that, so that's the ones that he is preaching to. Now, uh, his preaching sort of revolves around four different points or steps. He talks about this age that is now fulfilled, or at least ushered in, in Jesus Christ. And, and so he talks about the last days. He quotes from the book of Joel. He, he reinterprets the book of Joel through the work of Jesus Christ. And so part of his sermon talks about the, the ministry, the death, and the, and the, the resurrection, and the triumph of, of Jesus. And then again, he cites Old Testament scriptures as fulfillment of that. Uh, again, seeing the Old Testament through the work of Christ. And then the last part of his sermon is a call for repentance. And evidently, the, the sermon was fairly effective because we do know at some point in chapter 2, there are at least 3,000 people who come into the kingdom at the, from, from that whole process. That's where we ended last week. I uh, just wanted you to just kind of keep in mind this idea about the age and uh, eschaton is the word that we use to describe this. And particularly that in, in the New Testament, uh, New Testament writers were very comfortable with taking an Old Testament passage that dealt with something else. Normally it's something historical to the time of the writing and yet reinterpret it through the work of Jesus. And that's a little different with how we interpret Scripture they were that's totally fine that was a uh, they they would do that all the time so this psalm passage here both of these psalm passages they have to deal with with king david they david wrote those i mean it would have been about david's life but they see david and then all the lineage the king you know the 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 royal line from david as what david wrote about himself or his specific time as applying to all of them even now applying to Jesus. All right, does that make sense? Because if when you read the New Testament, they quote some of the stuff in the Old Testament. If you actually go back and look at the Old Testament passage, you want to go, really? I'm not sure this is what, what he's talking about here. You know, but that they that's that was a uh, totally fine in the first century. It's a little different with the way that we we cite and interpret Scripture uh, today. So this is all a recap, hopefully, from last week. Um, but, but I do want to, so we want to pick back up on verse 36. I think that's where, roughly where we, I just want to touch on 36 before we jump then into, uh, into 42. Uh, Let all of the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. This is a huge step for uh Jews to do this because they're equating now Jesus on the same level as God. Verse 36. Verse 36. So think back to Exodus, all right? So the children of Israel, they leave uh, Egypt. They travel in the wilderness for a little bit. They end up at the mountain. They're there at the mountain for a period of time. Moses makes these seven visits back up and down the mountain. Uh, I think on the fourth one, third, third or fourth one, he receives the, the Ten Commandments. What is commandment number one and two? What? Say it louder. That's all right. Don't be afraid. So what? Commandment number one. Only, only one God. Commandment number two. It's really nine. It's almost like nine commandments that are, you know, they take one and they split it. Yeah, no idols. And, uh, and the idea was that there is nothing on par with God. Actually, the names of the Old Testament that we have, uh, Yahweh, uh, Adonai, Adonai, things like that, they're really not the names for God. We actually don't know the, name, the, the ancient name, Hebrew name for God, because they, even to, to write it, had to be some level of like an idol. 
because you just put it down on paper, right? Uh, you know, and, and so they came up with another name, Yahweh, that stood for the name that we don't know because that name is so holy you wouldn't even say it, right? Uh, I mean, that's, that's okay, right? Yeah, thank you. Okay, yeah, you know. Well, I can probably, it is right. So, I mean, uh, you know, can anybody contest this? I mean, you know, so, uh, but, uh, so to say that Jesus is on same level with God, I mean, think about that level of move. Oh, yeah, I mean, it's so holy that even to say the name would be to profane it. And, uh, and so, to I mean, it was that level of reverence toward it. Mean, you would not even, uh, um, I mean, you just wouldn't come close to, to saying the name. And uh, so Yahweh is the name for the name. I mean, it, it, you know, Jehovah, you know, the name for the name. You know, I mean, it, it's... Uh, uh, we, we just don't know that name is lost, the, the, the actual, what, and this is what most scholars believe, what God said to, uh, um, to Moses, I am that I am, that we don't know. Who are you? I mean, that's the question, burning bush, who are you? And the next one is, who am I? You know, and, but that name, we don't know. Yahweh was the name to, to substitute for that name. In verse 36, and this is what, again, what I want you to see, what Peter is doing is he is equating this holy God as the same as Jesus. So, I mean, just think about the history of this, all right? So if you are, I mean, if you're like Peter, if you're one of the disciples, and, you, I mean, you, you know, your whole line is tied to, to Judaism. And everything that you've been taught about the name of God, there's no equal to this. I mean, even the com first couple of com commandments, I mean, everything that God touches and is about, the first four commandments, it is completely holy. The name, you don't, you don't, even, you don't even come close to, to, uh, to profaning the name. No idols, nothing ever is equal to God. Even the day that is associated with God, that's God's day, not anybody else's. And, and, but yet here, they have now just elevated Jesus to the level as, of God, to these other people. That's what, that's what he's preaching. I mean, this, this is a monumental uh, step here. Now, Jesus did it in the Gospels. But here, you, now you've got his followers doing the same thing. Well, why did they think that was a reality? Because of this. This, last, this season of last days has been ushered in in Jesus Christ. Well, what's significant about Jesus Christ? He lived, he died, he resurrected, he ascended. And that's the game changer for them. And the sign of that is the Holy Spirit coming. And so Peter cannot contain himself when it comes to preaching about this. It is, this sermon is everything about Jesus Christ being equal with God. I mean, there's so, there's so many words that we could sort of pick out, and, and, but we would, we would get stuck here for two months. And seeing how I have not completed an entire book with the exception of like Philippians, you know, which got, yeah, I mean, I can finish that one in a year. Uh, but anything that's got some, some chapters to it, I uh, have made, uh, I have vowed that we are going to finish. So we, we're, it, it's just a great sermon, and there, but there's so many things that are tied into this, chief of which, in verse 36, they're now calling Jesus Lord. And that really is that big of a deal. And so naturally, there's a call for repentance. That's verse 37 through 40. Uh, and and I, 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 some of you, last week, if you were here, you received a sheet of paper. that This is from N.T. Wright, who's a New Testament scholar. If you're not here, uh, do just let me know at the break. I've got a few extras. If you weren't here last week, I want to make sure that, that you, you receive this. Because this, um, what, this, this is the end of the, the paragraph that uh, N.T. Wright uh, wrote about this passage that I think is significant. He said, uh, 
whenever, and he's talking about, he talks about the, that we get a glimpse of, of what the church is developing with their understanding of the cross, who Jesus is, and that, that now comes with a level of awareness. And, and then he, you know, so you have the beginning of soteriology, all right? That word soteriology, the, the Greek word for that is sozo, where we get salvation from. So soteriology is the study of salvation. And you have the beginning of that here in, in this passage. And uh, the last two s- sentences I really like. Whenever we are in a mess of whatever sort and for whatever reason, we should remember that we are turned back and be rescued people. We are, and I just would add this, always, if I, if I could edit this, we are always repent and be baptized people. And, and, and it's because that now, it's because of this. I mean, in, in Jesus Christ, this is what makes Christianity Christianity. I mean, so much of Christianity, as we get into to Acts, you're going to see maps up to, to Judaism, maps up even to some other disciplines that have, you know, have prayer and fasting and things like that as a part, part, of, uh, part of their religion. But what makes Christianity Christianity, 100% Jesus Christ, which means there's hope. Verse 38, there's hope to always to repent, always to turn back to God, and, and that God is, because of Jesus, God um, is, is fully a, a, a graceful receiving God. All right, so all that's from last week. Sound pretty good? We're all on the same page? Any comments, questions, worries? We're all good. All right, so let's jump in now to what we to the last part of chapter two, because this is this is a pretty this is significant too. So if somebody would read verse forty two through the end of the chapter, forty two through uh, through forty seven. All right. All right, so what stands out just on first, you know, first thought, first reflection from this passage? Yeah, had everything in common, so there's some level of commonality. Yes, all right. Absolutely. All right. So there's levels of giving that's part of this. Fellowship. You would all be correct. And uh, so this is where we have at least the beginning of what the early church looked like. And there are four distinctive marks of this uh, that also show up in even churches today. Um, and, y'all, you, and y'all have named them uh, with the exception of one. Um, but here's what I want you to do before we get into specifically each one of those. Uh, imagine a world, put, your, put, your, put yourself in the, in, inside the text. Imagine your world without what we know about the Christian church. And then imagine that because of Jesus, now there's this new entity that's there that has this style of life associated with it. And then you can kind of get an idea of what it was like for the early believers. And those, I mean, they're now part of a, a community or, or an organization or a group that has teaching, uh, apostolic teaching, has, at least in the text, something that's called the breaking of the bread. And, and with that would be levels of uh, probably it's the beginning of communion. But we're going to talk... I'm going to unpack that here in a little bit. 
you have you have levels of prayer and you have levels of fellowship. Uh, it, so now that becomes part of your reality. And I mean, think about what the reaction would be from the people. Someone said enthusiasm. Is that right? Uh, well, there would be. Well, you don't have to brag about it, Susan. I mean, it's just okay. I mean, it's you know, it's all right. We all know it was you. I mean, but that's all right. Uh, that's okay. You know, you want a gold star? You got it. Okay, that's fine. And uh, but there's this level of this is a new life for them. And I mean, it's a it's a new it's a it's, it's like a new communal being that's taken place. And with that, they responded in certain ways. Uh, so let's look at each each one of these uh, four distinctive marks because what most people believe, as in scholars believe, that uh, whether you're talking about an early church or whether or not you're talking about a church 2,000 years later, uh, a church needs to have some level of these four aspects, these, mo- these four uh, distinctive marks in, in it to, to be effective. Um, th- at least 3,000 people uh, came into the faith, uh, and then you have this 42 through f- the end of the chapter that is, gives you an idea of what it was like after the 3,000 uh, come into the faith. Uh, so they have this level of uh, 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 apostolic teaching. Um, the disciple, right, so remember... Jesus is resurrected. He meets with them for 40 days. And part of what the beginning of Acts said was that he's teaching them. He's instructing them about things of the kingdom. Y'all remember that? Got to go back a little bit, a couple weeks. And uh, so part of this apostolic teaching is bringing in some of that. And at the same time, what we just talked about with who Jesus is, being on same par with God. Um, you know, one of the questions I, I asked of when I was kind of thinking about this, this passage, if the apostles are dead, which they are, uh, what are we to do? Carry on. Uh, carry on uh, with apostolic uh, teaching. The only problem is, you know how you become an apostle? There's really only... That's it. Say it again. All right. You have to. You have to. You have to see. I mean, remember we had we we, we found the replacement for Judas. What were the two qualifications? He had to be with Jesus before, and he had to witness the resurrection. Well, all those folks have died out. So, uh, uh, what do we do with with those who maybe are John on Patmos is the last one to die, he makes it to about the end of the first century. Uh, what about the second century folks? All right, so, we, so you got this level of apostolic now succession. And there are three things in the early church that, uh, because one of the questions that was asked of when you study church history is, well, now that the originals have died, what do we do next? And uh, the, way they, the way the early church dealt with that is they created three levels or three uh, pillars of authority. The first one is the, the theology, that Jesus is Lord. All right, so we have that in the Trinity. So when you read the creeds, the first seven creeds of the church that are actually uh, where the whole church met, uh, I mean, they all, every last one of them say the same thing. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Now, they talk about it differently. You know, one, one creed might spend more time on the second person. One, one creed might spend more time on the third person. Uh, but they're all of them for going into like maybe the, you know, 700 years. Uh, it, it's all about this, this idea of the apostolic theology. And, and the best way to, to summarize that uh, are the creeds uh, and the trinity. Um, the second one is the canonization of the Bible, Scripture. Because that is a witness of what it was like for the originals to be with God. And the reason why they, they canonized, they formed, some, some books didn't make it in. Uh, so it's a communal effort here on determining what's what, for the, really the reason why. 
so that we would have a record of what it was like with the originals. So the New Testament has to do with originals. Now, that's my term. That's not, you know, uh, um, but I mean, it has to do with the, the apostles and then the people who are, who are associated with the apostles. And then the last one is, is what Betty mentioned, the idea of apostolic succession. And then where in the beginning the apostolic succession was that the disciples or the apostles chose their replacements. Uh, Polycarp would be an example of that. He's a second century leader of Smyrna, I think. And um, he dates back to interact. He's like a disciple of John. But you can, if you study the church history, you'll find that they, they chose people who were with them in their ministries. So you have this idea of passing on to the next generation and, and on down the line. Now, uh, part of the formation in when the church is blessed by the Roman emperor to be no longer be the minority, but to really move into a level of majority. You have the apostolic success. You have all these sort of lumped into the person, the Pope. And the idea was that all the bishops gathered, and I think we mentioned this last week, uh, the, 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 all, all the Pope is nothing more than the Bishop of Rome. But you had all these bishops who would be like the area pastor, senior minister, and when they were dealing with all these heresies and managing the church, uh, and then they realized that they, when they're free to meet together, that's what the Council of Nicaea is. And they meet, and they're dealing with some, a number of different things. One, to get some level of uniformity to religious days. On the eastern side of the church, they would worship on these days. On the western side of the church, they would worship on these. So they, they dealt with that. The big issue was the, to deal with the Trinity, with this, this Arius controversy. Uh, and then what they discovered, all the other bishops got together. When they, or when they got together, they said, look, we got, we got a lot of things to do. We're just going to name one of, you, one of us that's going to meet with us, but they're going to be the theological spokesperson and watchdog for the church. And so their role is more administrative, for lack of better words. Our role is pastoral. Because not all of us can do that for the entire church. Uh, you know, we, you know I'm, I'm the bishop of Smyrna. I'm the bishop of Antioch. I'm the bishop of this. I'm the bishop of that. We got people that we got to pastor. So we need one person to sort of deal with whenever there's some things that, that come up in the church. That person is the pope. Now, over time, that, you know, you can, that's got its own history with that, and you can, you can trace that if you want. But the origin of that, that's, that's where the origin comes from. And, and the idea is to, to safeguard the theology, to safeguard the apostolic succession over time. So uh, anyways, I don't know if, it, if you're on Jeopardy, you might get it now. So, uh, but this idea of teaching is a cornerstone for, for, the, for the early church. You have to, you know, for people to see who Jesus is on par with, uh, with God. Jesus actually is God. Uh, I mean, that, that was such a large shift. And then to, to be able to express that in, in forms of teaching. You also have this idea of the breaking of the bread. Um, that's more like communion, but not communion the way we do it. More like a home fellowship meal. You know, would probably be Wednesday night potlucks. That'd probably be more like it, where you would have the. Keep in mind, the church is a minority; it's not a majority. So you have people. They meet in different homes, and they would have some level of communal meal. And then at some point in the meal, they would talk again about the work of Christ, and and in that would be the breaking of the bread. You have an idea of prayer. Now, th this is not uh, unique to, to Christians. Uh, actually, the, the prayer that they probably were a part of would still be tied to the temple or the synagogue, the daily prayer. There, there was two, in the morning sacrifice, in the evening prayers, they would go and pray. And then they would also maybe pray in their homes, but uh, prayer was definitely uh, a part of it, formal prayers more than anything else. Uh, and then this idea of a deep sense of fellowship or a deep sense of, of unity. 
um, verse 43 tells us that, you know, they, because of who Jesus is and what Jesus did, this idea of conviction of sin and forgiveness going together creates this, this awe, this reverence for this season that's now been ushered in. And, and there are signs and wonders that accompany that. Um, but there's something else that comes up in this passage, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit about this and maybe take our break because it would be a good place to end, is this whole idea of um, you know, people giving, selling assets or selling things and kind of giving it to the common. And, uh, and it's sort of a summary statement for the life of the church. Um, so what do you think about that? You like it? You don't like it? How so? Um, I think to give all of our possessions. To right. To, to, when we pledge to the church for the building. Sure, we sure. We give everything we have. Right. We give a portion out sure. of Sure. But if we were asked to give everything. Yeah, all right. So, uh, so when we read this, do we think that they're giving everything? Well, I'm, don't, don't get into where people, don't go a couple of chapters down the road yet. We're still on chapter two, so stay, stay in chapter two. This, this, you know, Luke is summarizing what the life of the early service was like. It says, and they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to the prayers. There's those four distinctive marks. And, and the result of that, awe, reverence, comes over every soul, and many sign and wonders were done through the apostles' And then it says, and all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking the bread. What comes after that? In their homes. In their homes they received their food uh, with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. So, did they sell everything? Yes. Right. Yeah, they, uh, this is why I mean, so many people read this and they think they sold it all and kind of lived out of a common purse. And there was a little bit of that. Um, but, the, you can't justify the idea of selling everything because they still are meeting in their homes. Well, if they sold everything, then how, where, what home are they meeting in then? You know, so, I mean, you, so... Sure, right. And uh, very thankful for the King James. <laughs> Unfortunately, the King James is about 78% accurate when it comes to translations. Now, my grandmother would argue... Okay, so I mean, I got to say that for Mamaw comes back and gets me. Uh, but uh, um, the the what's that? She would not. She would not. Let me tell you, not at all. She she, she wouldn't. Let me tell you. Uh, uh, she she would not at all. So, um, but the, the the idea is that they are they are incredibly generous, more generous. Now, it's, even inside of Judaism. There's part of your temple tax. Uh, there was some temple tax went to support the temple. Some of the temple tax went to support the needy. And I mean, it was it was not an offering. It was a tax, and everybody had to pay it. And uh, but there was what's woven in to Christianity and what's woven in into Judaism is this idea of caring for those in need, and they're still doing this. Uh, here. And what most likely happened is that they're, they're not selling everything. There are some people, as they're, they're selling certain levels of assets, and from that, they're helping those in need inside the, the congregation. That people didn't walk around with, uh, you know, they didn't have a bank account where you could put money in a bank, in a bank account. You, uh, your wealth was tied to your assets. Most of the time, that could have been like, animals and, and maybe property uh, could be that, um, clothing, 
you know, things of that nature. People would wear their wealth. Uh, they, they didn't have, you know, a, a brokerage account to where, you know, or stocks or anything like that. It just didn't exist. And so their assets were different than they are for us today. What they did do is they did sell, they did give generously uh, for the people inside of the community. But they did not sell all. All right, so I mean, um, this, the reason I'm making a big deal of this, you can pull up 10 commentaries, and the, the, many of the commentaries are probably going to be split 50-50 of that, um, you know, we, we've got to create this type of, uh, you know, our socialism almost, I mean, type understanding of how it works. For Americans, we don't like this passage. I mean, we don't. Let's be honest. Because we were what? Capitalists, right? You've got to earn your keep. I mean, yeah, that's it. All right, so don't take, go, go to the, uh, we don't have a church, I mean, we don't have a theological library, but just play around on Google, I'm, you know, and, uh, and pull up uh, interpretations of Acts 2, 42 through the end of the chapter. And, you, I mean, you'll, you'll get a critique of um, Western society and into something that's a little more of a, of a, a, a style of state that is very communal, common purse on everything, and and that's a that's a that's kind of a reading into the text a little bit more than what it's saying. Do you know how Christians today do we give more to the needy than the rest of the people in society? Um, The, the average, all right, so the average person in the, in the church gives, uh, there's about 2 to 3% that actually tithe. So I'm just going to talk first that way. That's about, that's about average. Uh, and it's been like that for a long time. Um, in, uh, I, I'm not sure, I mean, obviously, uh, I don't know the numbers of population inside of the United States who are, who are inside the church and who, who are not, um, part of our society is very is heavily influenced by Christianity. I mean, you cannot deny that. I mean, regardless if you think the world is going to the hell in the handbasket, you cannot deny that Western, this particular country, and even Europe, heavily, heavily influenced by Christian principles. Now, part of that is a, is a pretty good dose of generosity. And, uh, I mean, even the fact that you can get tax deductions for being generous, uh, I mean, that is, that doesn't take place in other parts of the world. And uh, so, I mean, you have to ask your question, why? I mean, why would, why would that even be a part of the picture? Well, I would argue it's because there's a level of, I mean, all over the place of generosity that is, that is steeped in uh, Judaism, generosity that is steeped in Christianity, I mean, generosity that's steeped in uh, Islam. I mean, one of the pillars of Islam is to give alms, and it is not even open for debate. I mean, you have to give alms. You have to give back to help those in need. So, uh, but the two, two other uh, monotheistic religions that were a part of uh, the, the foundation of our particular country, Judaism and Christianity, I mean, they're, they're, you're, you're very much generous people. Um, uh, yeah, that's about right. Two to three percent. No, of people in the church who tithe. Now I'm talking about a tithe. All right. What's what? A full ten percent. Yeah, yeah, full ten percent. Do what now? Yeah, all right. So of people who give, that that number is a lot higher. Uh, um, you know, tithing is 2 to 3% max. And it's been like that for a long time. Uh, the, I mean, you might get for like two and a quarter, one year, and then it might be, I, I don't know how they determine that because I don't know, how do they know their salary? It's all done by surveys. Do you tithe? And then people want to ask a question, are you tithing off your gross? Or are you tithing off your net? I, this is crazy, all right? I mean, you know, uh, I, I would rather people say, do you want to give generously to the point to where, before, here, here's what I think is important for Christians. Um, if you have to think about your gift before you give it, and it doesn't have to be to the church, right? You can give, to, listen, give to the museum, give to other, I mean, give to, I, 
I like the garden, sir. I love walking through the garden. It's beautiful. I like it, you know. So, I mean, uh, we're, we're trustees of creation, all right? I, 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 um, but if you don't have to think about your giving, you're probably not giving enough. It is what it is, whether you like it or not. It's not, I'm not, you know, I'm not angling for something for St. Paul. I, I've already angled it, okay? So, I mean, it's done, you know? I mean, uh, uh, I don't want to raise another dollar for the rest of my life. And, um, but my point is, it, seriously, I'm, uh, this is, because it's a, generosity is a heart issue. It's not a dollar issue. It's never been a dollar issue. I mean, Jesus highlights the woman who gives less than two cents. There, we don't even have a coin for that. Her, her, her gift was not even a penny, and he highlights her. So it's never been about the dollar, all right? And it never will be, all right? It's, it's giving generously this way is about, do I have to think about, do I have to, to write that check, I have to think about my other types of spending. If you don't, you're not giving enough. I mean, don't argue with me. Read the text. I mean, it, it's, you know, it's painful. I mean, because no I mean, we like, I mean, I'll speak first person. I like money. I mean, money makes me feel good. It's security. I, I, you know, I like doing things, you know. Uh, I mean, it, you know, uh, maybe you're different, um, but, you know, I'm not. So, I mean, you know, we fight that battle every year. We make our, I mean, I, you know, I get it. It's a, it's a sacrifice. Um, so whether or not it all comes to the church, you know, that's, work that out. I mean, I'm, I'm dead serious. It's not just sort of uh, being passive on it. Pray about it, and if you, you know, if God leads you in that direction, then be obedient. That's the best advice I can give you. Um, and I think a church, I think the church should be some of where you give it. Um, but I, you know, I think that it should, every person should strive to give sacrificially as a way of life because of what's been given to you. Whether, whether you're a believer or not, we live in a country that has been so blessed and wonderful. And level, but we don't, we don't deal with persecution. We don't have to worry about walking out of our house. There's level of safety. I mean, uh, um, be glad to pay your taxes. I mean, don't, I don't want to pay more than I have to, okay? But I mean, uh, you know, I mean, seriously, when you walk out of the do house, I mean, are you worried about somebody invading you? No. I mean, we, you know, we, we, don't, we have health care. Whether you got an insurance card or not, you got health care, okay? And, and, and the, the level of care that exists in our country, all these arguments, now, I'm, all right, I need to stop. So, I mean, uh, I'm just going to leave it at it. But it, it, we have been blessed in ways that are far greater than we can ever imagine. Now, I think part of that is because of what was, how our country was formed, heavily influenced by Christianity. And so whether or not you're a Christian or not really doesn't matter on one level. You reap the benefits of people who want to live a, a, in an economy that acknowledges what God has given and then what's required because of that gift, whether it goes to you, someone in your church, in your family, or just the neighbor down the street that you'll never know, it does not matter. We give not because we're commanded. We give because we want to be a generous person. Now, I would argue that the greed is real. And in our, in our society, greed is very much a part of the way we live. It is the voice on the shoulder that we all hear. The only way to combat greed is to give. There's no other way. I mean, you, you, you think that it's, it's going to be, it's, that's, you do the opposite of what you think should be the remedy. If I save more than I want, no. The way you deal with greed is by learning to be generous. And, and so, I mean, you know, at some level where, you know, it's kind of a gray area, but when, if you have to, to give to, to help people, however you want to interpret that, um, there needs to be a level of like, all right, I, I, you know, in order to do this, I can't do that. That's the number. Outside of that, I mean, you know, just, I'll do like Paul. Whatever else the Holy Spirit tells you, just do that too. So, all right, let's take a break.
All right, let's uh, go ahead and uh, find our seats. We're going to look at chapter 3. Before we do, are there any comments, I mean, are there any questions around chapter 2, the last little bit? Yeah, I don't have the bell. The bell's still in storage, and uh, we're hoping to, yeah, so we think the end of October, that's what we're kind of been moved to, and uh, so we're, they've, the projects on the last bit, uh, the administrative offices, um, you can kind of sneak a peek in there if you want. The fellowship hall is, for all practical purposes, completed. There's a couple of things that we, we're going to add, but for the most part, the fellowship hall is completed. And they're on the chapel narthex side, and they're uh, doing the renovation piece there. And that's also the prayer room that's in the process of being renovated. And then the uh, forum classroom uh, is that's all part of that last little bit. So we're we're hoping by the end of October uh, to, for the most part, be completed and and back into normal workings. Uh, so we're I'm counting the days. Yes, ma'am. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. But it talks about also the Christ. Yes, and right. That aspect of it brought those two things together. Yeah, so you have uh, some versions might say the Messiah. Um, so the Messiah in Christ means anointed one. And uh, so you have this idea of Messiah and Lord uh, being tied together. The Messiah was the one that was going to usher in the last days. That was really that the job, the job of the Messiah, and uh, and that would begin God's full restoration of the society. And um, in New Testament time periods, and really probably started in the the intertestamental period between the Old Testament and the New Testament. The uh, what developed was the role of the Messiah was to be either one or or two types of of persons. One would be like a military leader, or the other one would be like a savvy political leader. And uh, what, what was not developed until Jesus actually began his ministry was the idea of the Messiah being a suffering servant. And uh, so they, the, but the idea of Jesus being seen as Christ or Messiah, and then Jesus being Lord, that is the connection that they're doing, that Peter is doing. That's the game changer, and because that elevates Jesus uh, to co co-equal with God. It starts that by saying in this to let the whole house of Israel know. Right, right, that. right. So it's heavy. All right, so yeah. So the comment is the connection between Christ. Some versions say Christ. Some versions say either Anointed One. Some say Messiah, and uh, and then that again, Peter is preaching to. Israel, he's preaching to, to Jews, and uh, and by tying in the Old Testament, it's a uh, it's a um, an encompassing type sermon, not just for the hearers, but for all. What God, because the idea of last days and Messiah and the day of the Lord that that's Old Testament, and and what they're but what is significant is that they see all of that now as being accomplished in Jesus. And there, there begins this whole game-changing understanding for the disciples and for the church that now everything will be seen through the work of Jesus Christ. And uh, so when we get to chapter 3, which is where we're at now, you're going to see the first evidence of that because now a person is healed. People were healed before then, but what makes this passage specific, and this is what we're going to get to here in a second, is how he is healed, all right? So now that you're all waiting, right, and you cannot wait, that's, what, what's that? I'm not familiar with this one, so go ahead. Sal, why don't you hum us a little few bars? Go ahead. You're in the choir. Okay, I have to... I have to Well, that, you got it. I know somebody 
All right, so at 11.30, we're going to have a trio up here that Sally and Sandy, whoever else, somebody else raised their hand, and they're, they're, they're going to uh, give us a, um, you know, uh, yep, St. Saint, Saint Paul Idol, right? Uh, uh, so we'll have some judges, and we'll go there, right, yeah. Well, you know, listen, the Baptists, uh, um, you know, they, they, are, uh, they do a far better job of remembering the scripture than than most Methodists and uh, like uh, did y'all ever have to do uh, what do they call them sword drills you remember those yeah had to had to quote the scripture and uh, I hated that let me tell you boy as a little boy man they would make me do that and I just thought you got to be kidding me that's all right uh, no you're you're uh, Oh, there was, there was, there's Baptist and there was my grandmother, right? So, I mean, uh, and she was a black belt Baptist, you know, so, I mean, uh, yeah. Yeah, so the, 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 the reason she ended up in a, a Methodist church, uh, this is, all right, this is in line with Acts, okay? Just give me an anecdotal story, right? So, because out of, so my grandmother became a Christian late in life. When I say late, probably later than the, the average in, in her mid-40s and uh, went through some personal tragedy, and uh, there was a revival taking place in Temple Baptist. It used to be over on 2nd Avenue. And uh, just someone invited her to go there. She goes there, you know, altar call there, boom, my grandmother became. And she, I mean, just forever changed her life. And uh, she, I mean, never missed a Sunday. I mean, she was there all the time. And she used to drag us to church. Oh, my word, this was the worst thing in the world. And uh, she would call me a worm in hot ashes. That's actually her, the name for me sitting in church. I couldn't sit still. And she always, she sat like the third pew from the preacher, which is, please don't do that when you have grandchildren. <laughs> and um, so we, we uh, dr- drug us to tr- church all the time. And when, I mean, would be involved in all aspects of the church. Uh, she lived to be, I think, 91. And when she stopped driving, I think, Maybe uh, she had a she had a uh, slight illness, and so we we had to take her car away. This was probably in maybe late eighties, eighty six, eighty seven, somewhere mid to late eighties. And uh, I remember she bought a car when she was like seventy, and we thought that was the funniest thing in the world. And I thought, who who would sell her a car? You know, at seven, you know, seventy five or whatever, you know. And because by then, all right. So when you're, all right, hang on, hang on, stay with me now. When this happened. You know, we're like 18, all right? So, I mean, you know, it's, 25 was old, you know? And so uh, we, uh, so she, you know, she bought this little car and, and she had an American flag sticker on one thing and the Brave sticker on the other, you know? And, and uh, yeah, exactly right. So, uh, but she would go and pick up about four or five different ladies from the nursing home and take them to church every Sunday. And we would we would sit down. She would sometimes meet us for Sunday dinner after church, and she would uh, we would say, you know, what are you doing? She says, Well, I got to go and pick up the old folks. They they were younger than she was, and uh, so we would laugh about that. Uh, but boy, let me tell you, she was dying the wool. I mean, uh, to to end up this is where I'm going with this. The only way that she ended up in the Methodist church, obviously, one of her grandsons became a Methodist preacher. And when she, when she had to live with my mom, she lived with my mom the last few years of her life, just got out of necessity. Uh, that, so my mother took her to church where, where I was also serving uh, on staff at a, at a larger church. And, uh, but it was interesting. You know, you could hear this little, just tiny, tiny little woman in the middle of the sermon. You would, every now and then you would hear a, Amen. I mean, you know, just uh, that, that was typical for her, you know. I mean, so she, uh, I just thought, oh, memo. It's not the same. So one Sunday, somebody sat in her pew. Oh, my word. Let me tell you. I mean, I saw it. We were, by that time, she'd been in the Methodist church for a number of years. And so she sat in the same pew every Sunday. And a, a visitor came in and sat there. And I saw my grandmother walking in. Well, this was, you know, I mean, you might as well just had slapped her, you know. And uh, so I saw this. I ran down from the, uh, from the pulpit area. I, I, I was the liturgist before the service started and said, why don't you come up here and sit with Brooke? You know what I mean? Uh, so it was, it was, she told him to move. So, um, all right. So there's my grandmother. So, uh, 
but pretty much responsible for um, my entire family uh, being in the church and staying in the church. And uh, I could, I mean, she would pray. Um, I would, sn after I became a Christian, I would, and when she, particularly when she moved in with my mother, this was even after I finished seminary, and we would come back for the visit family. And uh, in the mornings and the evenings, I mean, she did not miss a prayer time. And uh, so she would be in her room and her door would be shut. And I say this jokingly, uh, she was jerking God around in that prayer. I mean, she, I mean, there was a list of people she was going through and she would not let go until she felt like God was going to answer that prayer. And I mean, I've, I've, I've heard so many of those in the morning and the evenings where she would just, uh, I mean, she'd go on forever. You know, even I got tired, you know, I was like, goodness gracious, but she was something else. All right, so uh, Acts chapter 3, if somebody would read for us verses 1 through 10. All right. Yes, ma'am. All right, so uh, a couple of things we want to um, sort of tie chapter 3 back into chapter 2. Now remember, the, the visible sign of this last day uh, time period, age, is the, the, what Luke describes as signs and wonders coming in through the Holy Spirit. And so chapter 3 is the first account of one of these signs and wonders, and that is that a person is healed. Um, you know, notice that the apostles, um, they're, they're worshiping in the temple, and so they're, they're attending uh, daily prayers. Uh, at least two of them are, are moving up uh, into the temple. And so they're on their way up, and the temple, keep in mind, is a series of courts. You have a large, out, the, the largest court by far was the court of the Gentiles. That's where they had the money changers. Think back to the gospel story. And so gent everybody could go in there. The, the name of the court determine who could go no further. So the court of the Gentiles, Gentiles could only go into the court of the Gentiles, but so could Jews. And then from there, they would go into where the, what was called the court of the women. That's where they had the treasury, those upside-down trumpets, and they were assigned to whatever the size of money. You drop it in there, and, and it would sound the trumpets. And, but women could go no further there, um, Jewish women. Uh, then men could go into the court of the men or the court of the Israelites. They could go no further. And then you had the court of the priests, and then inside of the court of the priests was the Holy of Holies that only the high priests would go at certain times of the year. So they're moving through these courts, going into what would be the court of the men or the court of the Israelites. On their way in, they pass through what is called the beautiful gate. It is there that this that friends of the, the the lame person they would place him there at the beginning of the gates most likely the beautiful gate existed between the court of the Gentiles and the court of the women because people would be passing through there either for prayer or passing through there to pay tax or alms or whatever so he's I mean he's strategically placed to receive alms uh, in, in 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 that day and it's there that he uh, is confronted by the apostles. Now, verse 4 through 6 is significant for us because this is where you really see the signs and wonders. Um, what you have is that Peter uh, direct uh, his gazed at him, talking about the lame man, as did John, and said, Look at us, in verse 5. 
And he, being the lame man, fixed his attention on them, expecting to receive something from them. Then verse 6, I have no silver or gold. Sally's going to sing it at the end. But what I do have, I give to you. And then you have this. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise and walk up. Healings, Jesus performed healings. There are accounts in the Old Testament of healings. Healings in, in the Old Testament were, were strictly at the hand of God or, the, or, or a prophet that God is working through. Same in the New Testament. Jesus says, what I'm doing, I do on behalf of the Father. That's, that's all, in all, all four Gospels. Here, you have Peter under the direction of God healing the person, but really, who, what, what's now involved in this? Not just Jesus, in the name of Jesus of Nazareth, in the name of this person that I just preached about, death, resurrection, and ascension, in his name, co-equal with God. In the Old Testament, only God could do healings. Now you have, in the name of Jesus, healing. And so this is the first example of these signs and wonders that Luke has mentioned uh, previously uh, in chapter 2, and now you see an example of that, that this guy now is healed. Uh, The command to to get up is accompanied now with the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. And, And then you see some level of progression. This is my term more than anything else. Uh, in verse 7 and, and 8, um, he says that, uh, you know, he took him by the right hand, he raised him up, so he's probably just standing, and immediately his feet and his ankles were made strong, and then leaping, he stood and began to walk. And, and notice that he entered the temple with them, walking, leaving from the court of, of the Gentile, uh, you know, moving into the beautiful gate, court of the women. He's gone on his way now to the court of the Israelites, the court of the men, to pray. So you, this is all was taking place inside the text. Um, and it's an example of, of uh, the signs and wonders that now uh, the working through the Holy Spirit because of who Jesus is and, and what Jesus did. Um, Naturally, there is a crowd because there would be people who were are either already in the court getting ready to pray uh, or who are on their way uh, to pray. And people would have recognized this beggar because of why? He was always there in that gate that they had to pass through. So he was a fixture. And what we'll discover probably next week, more so than this week, is that this really creates a problem. Because he, the guy, walks into the court, and they know that he used, you know, he was lame for the longest time. Now he's walking, and, he, and he's praising God, and they ask what happened. Well, guess what he says? Well, I, Jesus, of, I, I was healed because of Jesus, of, in the name of Jesus of Nazareth. Well, this is where it now really starts to get interesting for the apostles uh, going forward. Um, this is very similar to Mark chapter 2. You remember the story in Mark's gospel where uh, Jesus is in, he's in uh, Capernaum. He's preaching, and he's at a house, but they can't get to him. So four guys take the, the lame person, and they dig up the roof, and they drop him down in front of Jesus. And, and what Jesus said in Mark chapter 2, first thing he does is not heal the guy. First thing he does is your sins are forgiven. And then everybody in the front row is all upset because only God can do that. And he said, well, I'm going to prove it to you. Now I'll heal the guy. Because remember, Old Testament, only healings can be done by God. So if the guy is healed, then what Jesus just did in Mark chapter 2 is said, I'm, I'm the agent now. So, you, I mean, you know, uh, how do you know that a person's sins are forgiven? Well, you don't know if I just say it. But now if I heal somebody and everybody knows that only healings can come from God, then, you know, de facto means you're now able to say also that what I said earlier is true too. Uh, so this is going to get real interesting uh, for next week. We don't have, I don't, uh, well, we've got time. All right. Uh, so let's keep going then. Also, Luke 7 is another example. 
Um, Luke 7 is where Jesus, John the Baptist, uh, sent through some of his disciples, asked Jesus, are you the Messiah? What was Jesus' answer back? Mm -hmm. Yep, that's right. Uh, he actually, what he quotes is Luke chapter 4. All right, so this is a lot of Bible. I got it. So all you Baptists, you're loving it now, right? So I mean, uh, get a lot of Bible today. Well, in in Luke chapter four, when G in Luke's gospel, Jesus began his his ministry. Luke chapter four, he goes into the synagogue in Capernaum, opens up the scroll of Isaiah, and he reads from it. All right, some of you that went to Israel, we were in that synagogue. Remember that? All right. So he opens up the scroll, reads from the scroll of the book of Isaiah. And he talks about the year of the Lord's favor. And then he gives you four things that sort of are characteristics of the, the year of the Lord's favor. The good news to the poor, the blind see, the, it's actually five things, the lame walk, the oppressed go free. That's four things, yeah. And uh, so when John the Baptist in Luke chapter 7 asked Jesus, are you the Messiah? He says, well, go back and tell John the Baptist that these four things are taking place. Let him decide for himself. Well, I mean, you know, for an Old Testament, you know, for, for, a, 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 for a Jew who knew the Old Testament, they would know, I mean, it, you know, these are the characteristics of the Messiah. Well, if Jesus is doing these things, then he must be the Messiah. So we get here. Now, in this guy's name, now you see a person healed, Co-equal with God, so it's significant what's what's going on. I mean, Luke, Luke is, you know, first part of the God. All right, Luke and Acts, one book. First part is who Jesus is, Jesus' ministry, death and resurrection. Second part of the book is what we call Acts, which is really just the second part of Luke's gospel. And here, Luke is going to give multiple examples of what the first volume talked about. You with me? And this is the first one that we see that you have a healing in the name of Jesus. Up until now, the whole story that had taken place in Jerusalem, all right, but not in or around the temple. Notice now we've moved to the temple. The first part of, you know, the first couple chapters of Acts, we're not in the temple. Remember, we're just in the, we're in the upper room, then we're out to the streets. And so now we move to the temple, and so you have this demonstration of the power of Jesus' name, that, uh, that it's not quite in the temple, it's outside in the gate, but what you, you know, to, to God is on the move, for lack of better words. And he's not confined to just a certain structure or an institution that you see this outpouring of the Holy Spirit that comes with signs and wonders that will take place outside of the temple uh, and, and actually be inside the temple. What's interesting in Luke's gospel, you know, um, this is sort of a... a where you can impress your friends. Luke's gospel begins and ends with a temple scene. And so now you've got God moving outside of the temple, and it's about to go back into the temple for, uh, really for verification. I mean, the people, in the, they're, they're about to see that, that God is even, that in, in Christ, Christ is bigger than even the temple. Is everybody with me? Still good? All right, so let's, uh, um, let's stop. Uh, and the reason why is because I want to, there's, in this next paragraph where he's, where he's outside around the, the, the colonnade, I mean, I, I want to stop for a minute because uh, I don't want to get into that because there's a lot that goes on that has to do inside of here from what Peter said to the people who are out there. So let me just stop, see if there's any comments or questions or, or uh, concerns or anything that's unclear. Like faith healers? Uh, that, I mean, I would imagine some are still there. Uh, uh, in some places. Uh, I, I don't know of any, okay? So, I mean, um, you know, they're, they're uh, uh, you know, on TV there'll be people, I mean, but, that, but then that 
brings in the whole idea of TV. Um, you know, one of the questions that was asked early on was that, did the gift of healing end with the apostles? And, uh, you know, I, I've, I've been a part of people who, uh, there have been services where they've been prayed for and, and they, they're able to do things with their body that they weren't able to do ahead of time. Now, whether or not that's, I mean, I'm, I'm not in their body, so I can't answer whether or not it was a literal healing or not by, you know, by judgment, it would make some sense, or at least it would lead me to a higher probability that something like that would take place. Um, I mean, at the same time, you have the, um, I mean, you have doctors. And I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I don't mean that like, oh, it's like, you know, some derivative, but I mean, I think through somebody somewhere had to get the knowledge of all that. And, you know, I think, you know, to some level, the fact that God is active in the world. We have all types of, uh, you know, we get to swim in that world and live in that. And with, I mean, it's just God's goodness is so great. Even if someone is not a follower of God, they're going to experience a little bit of God's goodness, not because they have something inside of them that would dictate it. It's just that God is just that wonderful. Um, so, I mean, you know, so I think the rise of, of uh, science and some other things are fruits of that. I hope that makes sense. I mean, that's, that's a different uh, rabbit hole to chase that I'll be happy to talk to after, but I know some of you have a lunch date down at Countries, and I wouldn't want you to, to miss your favorite table. So, uh, Sure. Right, sure. Some of it has to do with, all right, so the monopolizing of faith healers, particularly in the 1900s, got a really bad rap. I mean, you think about uh, um, people like, uh, well, I mean, they're just some of the, the mo more noted ones on TV and and how some of that was... Uh, was some of it was fake, some of it was not, some of it was tied to an entryway to, to receive all types of funding. And, and with that came some terrible behaviors uh, that were publicized over the, the, you know, the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, and the 90s. So uh, I think some of that has influenced our thought on, one, what do we think about faith healers? And, you know, then... To your point, are we willing even to say some level of, you know, yeah, this took place either in my life or in their life, because does that, does that then move us into a camp that's similar to, to that, that level of camp? Um, I know when my niece had cancer years ago, one of the things that our family wrestled with, obviously as, a, as all believers, is, you know, what, what do we do with that? How, you know, do we rely strictly on science or, you know, to what level do, does our faith become a part of it? Um, I mean, I, I'm, I'll take healing any way it takes place. And so whether or not it, it comes from you praying for me, keep on praying. You know, there's a lot of stuff still got to be fixed, all right? You know, uh, or whether or not it comes from somewhere, somebody throughout, a, throughout the, the, the evolution of thought, okay, People have either insight into the brain or insight into emotion, social science, or physical body, or whatever. Yeah, I, I don't care. I, mean, I don't mean that. I mean, I'm not trying to. If, if you're staunch in one camp, I'm not trying to make light of that. I, you know, um, personally, in my theology, on some levels, it doesn't matter because the end healing has already been determined. And that is in resurrection. All right, and, I, and that's a big deal inside the, the early church, that uh, some healings take place, some do not. But they're, they're, they don't worry about whether or not a person was healed or whether a person was not healed, because what they know is that death is not the final. And, and, that, and I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to take two more minutes of your time, because I think this is really, really important. As a follower of Christ... This is woven into what you believe. And, and it drips all throughout the New Testament. 
I mean, the, the, you know, if you want to call it a veil that exists between the living and then the dead, for, for lack of better words, it is only just, it is a, it, it is a trans, almost a transparent sheet. And in the New Testament, they're fully aware of that. That's where we get the whole idea of the communion of the saints. And so to dismiss this just because we're heavily influenced by science and our society, you, you, you have a tendency to throw some aspects of what's woven into your faith out. You're just kind of throwing the baby out with the bathwater. Don't do that. And I mean, seriously, I mean, it, it, there is what we believe. I mean, you, you cannot read past, I mean, you, Acts, you can't even get into Paul's writings and not know this is steep, steep, steep into the faith. Uh, um, 1 Corinthians, where he even talks about the body being changed. And then in Thessalonians, one of the best passages in, in the New Testament is in Thessalonians, where, where he says, uh, I wouldn't have you grieve as every, just as the average person about those who've gone to sleep. Now, that's code words for those who have died. He says, we grieve differently. It is not a permanent grief. It is a, it's, a, it's a time until we're reconnected in this day of the Lord, which is the culmination. Now, we don't, like to t we don't, we don't talk about that as much inside of, the, inside of like preaching and teaching, but it is every much a part of the New Testament. That it is, you know, death is just passing from one part of life to another. And part of being connected to Jesus in death and resurrection is uh, that what happened to Jesus' body in resurrection will happen with all those in his name who die physically. Now, what makes us uncomfortable is we just can't see it. And so obviously, we, you know, there's not where we have, you know, we can't go over and then come back. So, oh, let me tell you what it's like. First step here, second step there. I mean, you know, it's a one-timer. I mean, you know, it's, uh, but, but it, it's, uh, uh, yeah, exactly right. Yeah, so, uh, but, uh, you know, it is uh, just because we can't put our finger on it doesn't mean it's not real. And you, and you can't dismiss that. You've got to hold on to that because it's, it's every, it, it's, it's, it's all over the New Testament. And it's distinctively New Testament, more, even more so than Old Testament. And, I, you know, it, and Paul and Peter, I mean, they all write about it because there, there is an expectation that when we die, it is not the end. I mean, even when they talk about what makes Jesus Lord or what puts him as, as co-equal with God is his resurrection, that he is, o overcomes death. Now, you know, whether or not you know, most of us, when we think about heaven, what we associate it with is our mama. I'm serious, all right? I mean, I'm dead serious. Uh, that level of comfort and whatnot, it's probably not that, all right? And, um, but it, it is, uh, but just, it, that doesn't make it any less real. And there is a communal part of that. You know, what that looks like, don't know. You have this idea of transformation, we only, get a, we only get little bits and pieces about that in the New Testament. But what that looks like, we don't know. But what is, what is not even open for debate in the New Testament is that those who die physically in Jesus Christ, they do not end. And there will be a time of reconnection in a communal setting with God. I mean, that, that's, that's, that's the New Testament. And uh, so, I mean, that, so that should free us up on some levels of anxiety that even though we don't know it, it doesn't, it doesn't mean that's the end for us or, or the people that have gone on before us uh, who, who, are, who are very much part of us still. Just different. All right. Go in peace. May the Lord be with you.